Hello everybody, welcome back. I'm the Strategy Professor, and I just wanted to really quickly address slash debunk um, some information out there that Slanesh is bugged and is all of a sudden a really bad faction, right? Because I just did a Slanesh guide a few days ago. I've been releasing episodes in a Slanesh campaign, so be sure to check those out. And I had several comments um, that were saying that Legend of Total War and that other people out there were also saying that Slanesh is bugged in terms of their marks of Slanesh and that the faction is now trash, that it's a bad faction. First of all, Legend told me, or Legend told the, the viewer in his video that he never researched Mark of Slanesh, like in his playthrough, which is absolutely insane. It's the best technology by far. It's the entire thing that makes Slanesh work. So it's really insane to me that a player that's supposed to be, you know, as high of a caliber as he is didn't see the potential for that but anyways he's a great guy i'm not trying to bash total war i think that he's not sick because there's some stuff that doesn't display correctly with slanesh and slanesh is still an incredibly powerful faction i think they are the best at manipulating and managing the map even more so than zinch okay so let me show you something in this campaign so this is a minor spoiler um it's turn 70 I didn't manage this particularly well, this is on Legendary. I um, decided to take a rift and go south into the Empire and just start fighting people. And I got in a little over my head, I tried to just take a 10 stack and siege, I don't remember if it was, I don't think it was Altdorf, but it was something that was crazy and I just wanted to do it for fun. I ended up losing my army, so I had to go in timeout for about 10 turns and replenish my army. So it's not even a good campaign. By my measures, like, I made some mistakes, lost the army there. I wasn't as aggressive as I could be up here in the starting province. Um, I think, ideally, you should take out these guys and occupy their property, and you should probably take out Nurgle and Corn if you can get to them. Because the thing is, you make a lot more money, a lot more money, off of actually owning properties and managing them than vassalization. The vassalization, for the most part, honestly, kind of sucks. It kind of sucks. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Because that was one of the main arguments that I heard was, oh, if you don't, if the mark of Slanesh doesn't give you like whatever it is, five influence per turn plus five corruption, you know, per character in a province plus all this other stuff, then it's just garbage. It's like no, it would probably be too strong. First of all, especially the corruption aspect of it. Um, but second of all. It, the vassalization is not even what makes Slanesh strong. I mean, look at my vassal money here, right? Like, this person's pretty good. The Celestial Loyalists, if you get a Cathay faction, they are pretty good. They give you pretty good income, and it's not likely that you're going to fight them early. So getting some vassals are pretty good. But I was still able to get a vassal vassalization with them pretty early, right? But if we start getting down into these Norskins, right? Like, Bjornling is 367 gold, right, for four properties, we look at this one, Sarl, 126 gold a turn off of vassalization. You can, like, my main province up here is, like, almost 2,500 gold per turn, right? So, if you just actually take over the area, you get way, way more gold. Almost 3,000 gold. And I don't even have this thing activated yet for the, the whatever, the 20% gold. Like, I don't even have all the buffs going on it, and it's 3,000 gold per turn for a four-province town. These things aren't even level three. I don't even have this maxed up to level three. It's just level two towns. So you make a lot, a lot of gold as Slanesh. And the vassals are bad, frankly, most of the time. And honestly, you can't vassalize somebody, and this might be a bug, I don't know. It seems counterintuitive, but you can't vassalize somebody if you're a defensive ally or a military ally with them. Okay, so I had to actually cancel a military alliance with someone in order to vassalize them, one of the uh, Norskins, and it hurt my diplomacy, and I got like, you know, the 120 gold or whatever. So it's really not worth it. It's like, who cares? And as far as like these little outposts, some people might say, oh, well, if you vassalize, first of all, you can get military alliances with a lot of people without the vassalization and still get access to these outposts. But if we go in and look at these outposts, they suck for the most part, right? Like... If we look at Outpost, these guys, I can only make Marauders and Chaos Marauders here. Bjornling, just Marauders. And this is turn 70. 
in a game. Sorrel. Literally nothing. Celestial Loyalists. Um, it's not showing me, but if I go over there, there were a couple of cool ones. Like I said, the, the Cathay faction, the Celestial Loyalist, is good. Um, right, let me see here. Can I... How do I get to the out... I'm trying to remember how to even get there. Um, it's so annoying to figure out where this is. Okay, so it's like right here. Zonshi. Alright, come on up. Let's go to Zonshi. But the thing is, as soon as I vassalized him, all of these other Cathayan factions just started going hard on him. Um... I forgot how I even... It's been so long since I've even tried. Oh, I just go to my army, I think, and try to recruit. And then it'll tell me. So it started off with a couple of interesting units, but then they started taking down all these other units. So if we go over here... It's been a little minute since i played this. All I get is this garbage, right? I get, like, peasant archers, peasant longbowmen... Jade Lancers are okay, you know, it gives you some armor, which Slanesh is missing, right? So it's like, some of this is okay. It was telling me that I was going to get the snipers and stuff, which would have been really good, um, or I think an artillery piece, but then again, everyone turned on the person as soon as I vassalized them, and they just started killing all their buildings that allowed me to hire the cool stuff. So, you just don't get a lot out of it. You don't get a lot out of the military lines, you don't get a lot of money out of the vassalization. That's not the strong suit. It's, I know that's one of the marquee things that if you look at it on a surface level, it's like, ooh, I can force vassalizations, right? There are also stipulations on that. Again, defensive and military doesn't work. And you can't vassalize someone that is a named faction. So someone that you could play, you can't do that to them. So you cannot vassalize Katarin. You cannot vassalize Miao Ying. You can't do them. You can't do the Western Province guy. So most of the big factions out there that are humanoid, that are strong... And Cathay and Kislev can't vassalize him, can't vassalize her. You can't even get them. And they're the ones that usually take over the map and start getting all the settlements and provinces. So they're going to have all the money. They're going to have all the stuff you might want. Like, one of the only factions, like, on the entire map that's worth it, where you can actually make money, that I scouted out, is these loyalists. And again, they are being eradicated right now by the other Cathay factions as soon as I vassalized them. Um, is again, Mao Ying and the Western provinces, they have everything. 12 settlements, 13 settlements. Everybody else is poor as hell. I'm not going to make any money on that. Um, and then you can't vassalize demons. Um, you can't vassalize greenskins or ogres. It's only humanoids. And yeah, okay, you can vassalize empire people if you want to, but why not just go down there and kill them? Again, like, you make way more money if you just kill them and install your own provinces down there. So I think that's the best strategy, is take over the upper left, as I talk about in the guide, take over the upper left, just be friendly with everybody else about when the rifts come up on turn 30, and then come down here with your tier 3 cav and your tier 3 exalted demonettes, don't take on excessive risk like I did, and just start killing them and taking everything. It's a very rich area, it's got a lot of dense towns in it, um, you're going to be friends with the Norskins to the north, and then that gives you an opportunity, a staging ground, to go fight Kislev. Okay. So, that doesn't work. So what is the true strength of Slanesh then? Why do I think they're still strong? It's the cults, guys. It is the cults. It's not the vassalization, it's the cults. Why are the cults so strong? Well, look at this. Look at how fast you can put these cults up, right? I literally, I believe, maybe not fully literally, but almost literally, have a cult in every single Empire province here. And again, I wasn't even fully optimizing this. There is a cult everywhere everywhere and that spreads influence three per turn and because i have so many heroes i have 19 um cultists right because you get a cultist every time you spread a cult you can get another cultist and they start spreading geometrically so it just goes everywhere the cults go everywhere you get a billion cultists and with those cultists you can get different followers and different traits that add extra corruption. So these cultists will throw out like 50 million corruption. So everything's already corrupt. Like I, everything's already purple before I'm even there. 
you don't need the Mark of Slanesh to give corruption. It would be overpowered to an insane level if it did. Everything's already purple before I'm even here. Um, and that is really strong, right? Because that's going to give them um, attrition in all of their home territories. It's going to put pressure on them can, uh, in terms of public order. So they constantly have to defend their towns or they're going to get taken by uh, rebels. Um it's going to give you a lot of extra bonuses in those properties. So the corruption is really good, but you don't need the cultists for the corruption. Just the cults themselves and your heroes are already going to spread it at an exceedingly fast rate, way faster than any other faction. Um, okay, so you got a bunch of cults everywhere. What's the big deal? Well, the thing is, um, and I don't think it's going to say it here because I already have a building. But there's a building in this chain. So this is the OP one. This is the one that gives you six influence per turn a lot of times and gives you a free extra cultist. You don't even, it puts the cultist in that location. It doesn't even give you recruitment capacity. So you have to hire it at your capital and then walk it across the whole map. It literally puts it on the spot at that location ready to infest the next area. Like it's just a chain reaction across the whole map of cults everywhere if you do it correctly. Um, so what's the big deal about this? You got a bunch of cultists, you got corruption everywhere. That's good. So what? You can sell this building. And I'm not going to do it right now, but you can sell it. It's going to give you back 1,500 devotees, or 150 rather, devotees. You can buy another building for 250. When that building completes, you get a free devotee army that spawns right there, and you can move it on that same turn. Why is that important? You get a ton of free armies. It doesn't cost you gold. Every, every turn, it's only 20 devotees for the upkeep. I have 4,600 right now. I'm earning 1,300 a turn, which, by the way, Total War was wrong about that. The tooltip is bugged. When you look over somebody, right, it says plus 10 devotees per turn, and you might think, oh, that sucks. That's not that good. That's not the number. It's 30, okay? Just like it says in the technology, it's just the tooltip is wrong. So you're supposed to get five base... And there's this technology, which is, again, the best technology by a country mile that you need to rush ASAP with Everlasting Gift plus 25. Okay? I have 19 cultists. There are marks of Slanesh on people. But I will guarantee you there are not 120 lords with marks of Slanesh on them right now on the map. Right? It's probably much closer to something like 40, which would give me about 1,200 that I have marks of Slanesh on. There, there's just... Just think about it logically. There's not 120 lords, right, that are in the Empire right now in this property. I mean, we could just look at it. There's not 120. Look at how many marks there are. There's one. I mean, we could literally count them. I'm not going to count them all. But just, just take this as a sample size. One, two, three, four... Five, six... Seven, eight, nine. Y'all get the picture. It's not 120. It's 40. Okay? In both places. Because I'm only marking up... Um, right now, I'm only marking these guys up down in Empire. And I'm only marking up Cathay. Okay? So, it does give you the full 30 for the devotees. And, you know, Legend was like, Oh, devotees are good, but who cares? It's all about the vassalization. It's, it, it's literally the exact opposite. Okay? It's the devotees that matter. Because the devotees are what allow you to get all of these free armies. Okay, so you sacrifice whenever you want to attack a town. Because if you take the town, it gets rid of the cult. So whenever you're going in to take the town, you build a new, the new thing for the 250 devotees. It spawns a fresh army, somewhere between 10 to 15 free units. And then you use those units to attack that town. It's only a 20 devotee upkeep. You go to the next town. You spawn another army of 10 to 15 free units that only have a 20 devotee upkeep. You spawn a new army. You go to the next town. And so on and so forth. So every single town, you're getting a free 10-stack army that can accompany you. Yeah, it has attrition, whatever. Like, who cares? It's going to be just an overwhelming amount of free units. You're going to have, like, like, 100 units or more that you can spawn. Like, I could spawn... A free army of 10 to 15 in all of these places on the same turn if I wanted to. And it wouldn't cost me one extra ounce of gold. It would all be devotees. 
and they would be 250 for each one and 20 upkeep. I could very easily, I mean, I'm getting 1,200 a turn. I could easily afford comfortably like 50 of these at 20 per turn. 50 free armies, that's 500 free units if I wanted to. And these uh, towns don't even generate devotees. It's the cultists and the Mark of Slanesh. So it's just keeping the Mark of Slanesh with 20 cultists every turn, just making sure everybody has Mark of Slanesh. Boom. So it might look like I don't have a lot of gold because I'm paying whatever 250 times 20 is, 4,000, 5,000 gold for cultists right now. Um, and I've even deleted some of the cultists. I'm not even like going to the max on this because there just aren't enough lords to mark <laughs> on the map. Um, but that is, like, try to say that's not powerful. That is absurdly powerful. So you get big money. Um, you get diplomatic control over almost everybody. Whether they're vassalized or not, you can still get military alliances with them. Um, and you just get free armies everywhere. Like, how the hell are you supposed to stop that? Like, that's one of the most overpowered things in the entire game. Even without, you know, like, what he was saying... And I don't know if it's bugged or not because I rushed that technology ASAP before I even had a cultist. I had that technology. So yeah, maybe it's maybe it's bugged in the sense that like for every single mark of Slanesh, you don't spread five corruption. Again, doesn't matter. The corruption's already there. But the whatever, six influence per person um, would probably be over the top. But again, who do you even want to vassalize? Who cares if it's six influence per turn? It sucks. Again, you can't vassalize dwarves. You can't vassalize demons. You can't vassalize anyone that matters in Cathay except for the Celestial Loyalists, and they're going to get wiped out. Can't vassalize Greenskins, Corn. Can't vassalize the two Kislev factions that matter. Yeah, I could vassalize, like, this dude that has one town and get, like, 20 gold a turn. Can't vassalize Nurgle. Can't vassalize Ogre. I don't think you can vassalize the rogue armies. Can't vassalize Skaven, Savage Orcs, Empire. I could but I'm going to make way more money actually killing the property and building up my own stuff. So it's like, can't vassalize Jeep, um, Zinch, Vampire Accounts. You can Warriors of Chaos, but again, these guys are garbage. You're going to get like 100 gold a turn. Um, so who cares? Like, it, it doesn't matter. It's not affecting the power level of Slanesh at all. In fact, I would argue, like... It's still too strong. It needs to be nerfed. 30 devotees per mark that you can spam every turn. It probably costs you like 150 gold a turn if you just max specialize first, which reduces the cost by 40%. And there's another technology that reduces it by 20%, like I talk about in my guide. Um, so you're going to be reducing the cost of span spamming hinder replenishment on everybody by 60%. <coughs> So it's like for 150 gold a turn, you're basically buying yourself 30 devotees. And sometimes those marks stay on for longer than a turn. Occasionally they can stay on for a very long time. I don't know what determines if it stays on one turn or 10 turns. But anyways, that's really strong. Now, if you do get the seduction up on people, and you will because a lot of these cults, again, the cults also give three seduction minimum up to six when you get those buildings everywhere. It does give you some benefits, even if you don't vassalize, right? So it starts lowering their leadership. It makes them less resistant to seduction. Um, allows uh, them to sign peace treaties with you if you want. And the big one is, like, when they're really um, over the top, then they get, like, leadership penalties, right? So if you look at the Cathay faction, that's the big one. You get, like, whatever it is, minus a lot to leadership. Minus 16 to leadership. So that's good for killing them, even if you don't vassalize them. So, yeah, seductive influence is good. If you really want to cheese it, just, you know, have a bunch of property, have a bunch of money. You can throw money at them. Whenever you give them a small gift, money-wise, it's going to give you, like, 15 or 20 um, extra points. I did that with this guy in order to, and I should have bought him off sooner, but you can do that. So there's still a lot of ways you can win the game, like... Slanesh is still extremely overpowered. The only faction that I think that might be stronger is Nurgle, and that's arguable. Like, if you look at my tier list to go see, if you're looking at strictly just who can power through the map better, who has the most OP map management, I, I think it's, I mean, it's Slanesh. Like, you can't argue with having free armies everywhere. 
Like, you can argue it might be boring to click on your the heroes that much and to spam Hinder Replenishment for five minutes every turn. Maybe not that long. Maybe three minutes every turn. That could be boring. That could be a playstyle you don't like. They're harder to fight in battles. You have to actually micromanage your units. You can't just blob up and, like, you know, run through the front door like you can with Nurgle, which Nurgle's my favorite faction. Um... But it's undeniable that this is an insanely strong, like, borderline, if not over-the-top, overpowered mechanic. Like, again, I've just had one army, I've literally had one province the entire time, and just played nice with everybody. I even lost my main army, um, and I still have, like, superior map presence everywhere. And you also get, look at this, I'm getting so much corruption right now. I've almost got it maxed out at 3,000 by turn 70. Again, with pretty poor campaign management in hindsight, right? Like, again, could have managed the top better, could have not lost my main army, but it was like one of the first campaigns I did. But whenever you have this maxed, every 15 turns you summon this, um, you get a free devotee army every turn. Five free devotee armies. That's the 10 to 15 stack armies every turn for five turns now um that army can't move now i don't know if there are stipulations on that i haven't used it but you might be able to just hire a lord put them there and just use them to channel these five extra armies um obviously you probably wouldn't want to use this on your main lord but that's insane five free armies have you looked at what some of the other factions have they suck a lot of them um but this is like absurdly op so anyways, that is just like, kind of triggered me a little bit, right? Not not being mad at anybody, but just, just kind of the misinformation out there that Slanesh is somehow some horrible faction now and not good. It is extremely powerful. And if people don't understand why Mark of Slanesh and getting 1,200 devotees per turn and being able to put cults everywhere, even when you're, you should by all accounts be behind in the campaign for mismanaging some things, like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> That's so strong. Um, I mean, and I, I've got them everywhere here, too. I have them all over Cathay. I just literally summon armies everywhere. Like, I'm building them out all over the whole world. It's just like, it's basically, think about it like the Skaven, right? How you can summon that Vermintide. But you know what? You can only put up one of those Skaven towns every 15 turns, I think. It's 10 or 15 turns. One Skaven town, the enemy can detect it and wipe it out. So you have to invest a lot of gold into it to build it up. And you start off getting really garbage units if you summon a Vermintide. It takes like 15 turns to do it or something. I don't remember the exact numbers. And you have to have a lot of technology. So like turn 150 before you start getting into the good Vermintide units. Right? So you gotta have like late game, like 150 tech. You gotta drop like, I don't even know what the number is. 5,000 gold at least into a town. The enemy has counterplay to it if they have the right kind of buildings to detect it. Um, and you can only put one up in 10 to 15 turns and you have to physically walk a unit over there to do it. Okay? Now think about Slanesh's version of that. You get it, three of those for free, basically. Every 10 turns, you get three. And then every time you make one, it can make another one every three turns. Because it summons a cultist. When you build the building, it takes three turns. And the cultist can move on the same turn. So you go over to another building. You spawn another cult. As soon as that one's done in three turns, you get another cultist. You, and you get to keep the first cultist. It does not destroy them. Um, then you get to summon another one. Go get another one. It's, and then after 15 turns, it's a 15 turn cooldown per cultist. Not for your entire faction. Per cultist. So you just keep spreading the cultists every turn. And then once 15 turns is up... You go over and do another one. And you get to keep spamming this hinder replenishment on all of the units and building up this massive army of Mark of Slaneshes. So far, this hasn't cost you a single gold. Literally not a single gold. Well, you have upkeep. So that's not entirely correct. You have upkeep on your heroes, and it costs you 100 to 150 to use that. It costs the same thing for Skaven. Upkeep on the heroes. It costs money to establish the, the building. Okay, so that's the same. But you don't have to pay any money for the buildings in these towns. So you spread it astronomically faster for a much, much less gold cost. There is zero counterplay 
the enemy can have. They can be sitting with 20 heroes in their town. They cannot remove that cult. As far as I know, there's nothing they can do to remove the cult other than maybe abandon the town or burn it or something. Right? So there's no good way to remove the cult. And then as soon as you spawn it, you can get 10 to 15, sometimes really good units. I don't know what determines the quality of units that you get, but one recent one that I spawned down there was something like... Um, I don't even remember. It, it was a lot. It was like at least tier 3 units. It might have been tier 4. I mean, I can just spawn one real quick right here and we'll just see what we get. Oh, no. I already spawned one fairly recently. Okay, maybe I can't. Because I have to destroy the building and then build a cult. Um, in order to do it. But you get you get decent units in it, right? It's like, that's for, this is like an undercity on crack. It's, it's just like insane. It's insanely strong. I can't express that enough. So again, you may not like, it's the play style is not going to be for everybody. Um, again, the combat is hard. You do have to click a lot with heroes, but it is undeniably ridiculous if you know what you're doing and you use those two technologies, the cost reduction um, and then the Mark of Slanesh, which still gives you 30. So... Is it nerfed from where it was? Maybe. I don't know. I think that's a deliberate balanced decision that if you're getting 30 devotees, you don't need that other crap. It'd be way, way too good. And again, as I've said a million times, the other stuff doesn't even really matter. The corruption, it would be faster. It would probably be OP. But you're going to get it corrupt anyways. It's already really fast um, because all of your heroes are going to be giving like five corruption each once they get the follower that gives plus two and then you put three points into corruption and then they naturally have one. You're going to have like six corruption per hero in a province. So just stick like three of your heroes because again, they're going to be all just everywhere, right? I've deleted like 15 of them because I didn't want to pay for them anymore. Um... And as far as the influence goes, there's no one to vassalize other that matters other than literally the Celestial Loyalists, <laughs> which you can still do very quickly um, over in Cathay. That's, that's almost literally the only faction that's worth vassalizing on the entire map. <laughs> so anyways, I hope this helped. I hope this gives you some insight. Hopefully it's not too long and people actually watch this. But yes, yeah, Slanesh, very, very strong. If you don't mind clicking on heroes, if you don't mind microing a little bit in combat... They're extremely powerful if you just like the idea of almost like zombies, just cult armies just coming up, you know, from the ground everywhere and just nuking everything. If you like Skaven and Vermintide or the, you know, blow up the town thing that you can do with Skaven, if that's your, if that's your thing, then I think you'll really like Slanesh because it's that, but even better most of the time. So anyways... That's going to be it. Thank you very much. Be sure to watch my Slanesh guide if you want some more details about how you can manage your opening turns on Slanesh. Again, I think I learned quite a bit for making you know a few mistakes earlier on in the campaign. Um, but if you want to learn a little bit there, if you want to you know have me go through some of this step by step, which technologies to get, you know which skills you should get on those cultists, which skills you should get on your lord, which units are worth getting, which units aren't worth getting, I'll give you another tease here. Um, for that guide, I would ultimately just try to have your army look something like this, where you're using Exalted Demonettes of Slanesh, and then these Heart Seekers of Slanesh. If you can't afford the Heart Seekers before the first rift, just get the normal Seekers of Slanesh. They're pretty good too. If you do get a military alliance with the Cathay guys, just get something that has armor in it. I went ahead and got some Jade Lancers. Not required, but useful if you can do that. Um, and then the Fiends of Slanesh are kind of whatever. They're alright. If you Again, if you can't get to Tier 4, I think the Demonettes are better than the Heart Seekers. Don't get Marauders. They're a waste of time. If you can't afford the Exalted ones, just get the normal ones. But this is it. Just do hit and run. Run around. I talk about it in the video. They're incredibly powerful, even on Sieges. So, anyways, that's it. Thank you very much. Be sure to like and subscribe. Check out the content. Check out uh, the guides. Like I said, I have one for Slanesh. I have one for Nurgle. And I'm currently doing a playthrough for Slanesh where you can see how I got to this point in the campaign. And I'm doing a Nurgle playthrough, and I'm going to be doing a Scrag Ogre campaign playthrough as well. And I'll probably do an Ogre Guide soon. I'm going to keep cranking the content for you guys. Hope you enjoy it. But I just wanted to give my thoughts on this and just clarify, you know, they're really, really good. You can still play Slanesh. They're still one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful, factions in the whole game. So thanks, have a good day, and I'll see you next time.